Nobody took notice of her until after she died. Nobody. People bought her things, you know, who were devoted to her as a person. Many people bought her things. But uh, they were always comparing her to the great maestro, to Diego. Her paintings were often intense and always personal, mirroring a life of sorrow and pain. At six, she had polio, and at 18, an accident left her crippled and severely damaged her spine. She underwent numerous operations and spent much of her life bedridden. Because of her illness, she had several miscarriages and abortions and remained childless. Despite her afflictions, she relished life and revealed to others little of the torment which infused her paintings. Her student, Fanny Rebel. Nobody could believe that a person who had suffered so many uh, physical um, tortures, you know, uh, could have such a sense of humor and such a mood for living, such a wonderful willing to live, and to talk about all her um, pains with humor. While Frida suffered physically, Diego himself was the source of another kind of anguish. He frequently indulged his weakness for beautiful women. Her friend, Adelina Zendejas. Le gustaba hacer sufrir a la gente. Y a veces fue muy cruel con Frida. No de la crueldad de física ni nada de eso, sino de otro tipo. Pero ella lo quería mucho. Y él la quería mucho. Women have fallen in love with her work. Art dealer Marianne Martin. Certain people just feel uh, this sense of identification when they see her work and they see her um, suffering. And uh, I would say a little bit her masochism at the risk of being provocative. I find a lot of people identify. They feel that this woman is speaking to them directly. I think she was a little self-obsessed. And I, think, I suspect that she was intensely narcissistic. Her biographer, Hayden Herrera. I think that she wanted it's like a novelist wanting to tell her story. She actually needed to tell about her pain and about the events in her life. Her childhood sweetheart, Alejandro Gomez Arias. Era un México que todavía estaba estremecido por los últimos movimientos revolucionarios. Ella, como todos nosotros, como su generación entera, es una hija de la Revolución Mexicana y, consecuentemente, ella estaba vivamente interesado en lo que acontecía. Necesariamente tenía que in impresionar a una mente tan abierta y tan frescamente eh, juvenil. Pues ella era una gran estudiosa del marxismo, leninismo. Y ella odiaba la desigualdad. La desigualdad en cuanto a pobres y ricos, en cuanto a hombres y mujeres. Nunca entendió eso porque ella fue una mujer liberada, pues, desde los 15 años. ¿Qué era lo importante de Frida? Que la singularizaba. Era que ella era una muchacha totalmente diferente a las demás muchachas de su tiempo. Muy, ahora se dice, sexy, muy atractiva, y a pesar del pequeño defecto que entonces tenía en una de sus, de sus piernas, a pesar de esto, era una muchacha casi atlética. At six years old, Frida had been stricken with polio, but she hid her lameness. Ella nunca demostraba que hubiera sufrido esta enfermedad. Caminaba siempre como volando. Su faldita plisada se extendía. Por los corredores se le veía siempre como volando, a brinquitos. Y caminaba así para que no se le notara la diferencia entre un pie, una pierna y el otro. 
On September 17, 1925, the accident occurred which would transform her life completely. From the center of the city, she and Alejandro left school and took a bus home. Es un accidente como los que acontecen todos los días en la Ciudad de México y cuyo relieve principal es que en este accidente la protagonista principal era justamente Frida Kahlo. ¿Qué pasó ese día? Pasó algo sencillo, a la vez dramático y vulgar. Tomamos un autobús, un tren eléctrico golpeó al autobús, lo destruyó y quedaron heridas y muertos varios de los pasajeros del autobús. A ella la molestó mucho uno de los hierros en que se afirmaba el camión para poner otro hierro para agarrarse y no caerse. Uno de esos hierros le entró directo por la vagina y le golpeó las vértebras. Frida would say Riley, I lost my virginity. Her pelvis and spinal column were each broken in three places. Her collarbone and two ribs were broken. Her right leg had 11 fractures and her right foot was crushed. Confined to bed, she was bored and restless. Her father lent Frida his paint box and she began to paint. Showing astonishing natural ability, she produced her first serious painting and her first self-portrait. Ella Wolfe, the wife of Diego's biographer, Bertram Wolfe. And these young people from the Preparatoria used to watch Diego paint. And Diego was a strange looking fellow. He had an enormous middle. He had the most beautiful hands of a woman and he had the biggest feet, and then he had eyes like a frog. So everybody called him El Sapo, the frog. En una ocasión yo la acompañé y estábamos sentadas en las escaleras y él estaba en el templete donde pintaba la pared. Y de repente me dijo, qué precioso es Diego, ¿verdad? Yo quisiera tener un hijo de él y yo pegué un grito y le dije, tan cochino y tan feo, porque Diego era monstruoso, era así. Despite his appearance, Diego was a man of extraordinary charm and personal magnetism. He was in the middle of a tempestuous marriage to a second wife, Guadalupe Marín, a striking woman whom Diego portrayed in his murals as a voluptuous figure. By contrast, Diego's first portrait of Frida pictured her as a revolutionary distributing arms. Eager for his opinion, Frida showed several of her paintings to Diego, her biographer, Hayden Herrera. He liked the paintings very much and was extremely encouraging to her and said she should definitely go on and become a painter but he also liked Frida. They shared um, leftist values and they shared an interest in art. I think that she was entranced by Rivera who was incredibly charming, brilliant, articulate, funny, warm, complicated man and it also she said that she liked his great big fat baby-like body. I mean she told her school friend that she would like to wash him and give him a bath. There's this turn towards Mexicanism in her work and her so, this first self-portrait after she came into contact with Rivera, she's wearing a Mexican blouse, I think Aztec beads. And so the whole stress on the Indian side was very important. After a courtship of almost two years, Frida and Diego were married on August 21st, 1929. He was 43 and she was 22. I fell in love with Diego, and my parents did not like this because Diego was a communist, and because they said that he looked like a fat, fat, fat Bruegel. 
They said that it was like a marriage between an elephant and a dove. When Diego married Frida, he wanted his closest friends to meet Frida, his new wife. But he made the mistake of inviting Guadalupe, the wife that he had left. Guadalupe got up went over across the aisle to Frida, lifted up her brown taffeta dress and shrieked, for these two crooked legs he left me. The arrival of the world-famous muralist and his young wife made headlines in the city newspapers, and they were courted by San Francisco society. Frida posed in Mexican costumes for Imogene Cunningham and other noted San Francisco photographers. Ella Wolf. They loved the dramatic look in Frida. They just loved her because she was something new, something different, something exotic, the likes of which they'd never seen before. When the couple was photographed by Edward Weston, he described Frida as a little doll alongside Diego, but a doll in size only, for she is strong and quite beautiful. Dressed in native costume, even to Huarachis, she causes much excitement on the streets of San Francisco. People stop in their tracks to look in wonder. While Diego worked on his murals, Frida also painted, mainly portraits of people whom she met and knew in San Francisco. She always mocked herself as a painter and thought of herself as sort of almost a amateur. She presented herself as a kind of charming amateurish painter, especially early on. and. It was Rivera who kept pushing her and wanting her to paint, and she sort of painted when she felt like it. And Rivera really wanted her to work harder. In his mural at the Pacific Stock Exchange showing the bounty of California, Diego included a portrayal of the famous horticulturalist Luther Burbank. In a startling interpretation of the same subject, Frida portrayed Burbank as half plant and half human, death and life, nourishing each other. She revealed her interest in fantasy and in the duality and interconnectedness of life and death, elements intrinsically Mexican, which would reappear in her work. In the painting, Self-Portrait, on the borderline between Mexico and the United States, she contrasted the industrial north, its smokestacks and machines, with the harmony of her native land, and replicas of its ancient culture. In Detroit, Frida became pregnant and was delighted about the prospect of having a child. Lucien Block, one of Diego's assistants who lived with them in Detroit. I heard this strange sound. I thought she and Diego were having a, an argument. It was about four in the morning. It sounded like uh, they were having a, a violent argument and she was crying and I didn't know what I should do. And suddenly Diego came in and said, Lucien, call a doctor. Frida ha is having a miscarriage. And she was in a pool of blood and she was crying and sh her hair was all wet from crying. In the painting Henry Ford Hospital, Frida recorded the sorrow of her miscarriage, picturing around her bed symbols of her pain and misery. With this work, she began to use painting to tell of the suffering in her life and to release some of the pain. After her miscarriage, Diego urged her to continue to paint. He said, why don't you paint stories of your own life? And uh, almost immediately after that, she painted the very beginning of her life. And she showed herself being bo born with her head and her eyebrows already there. When she painted those paintings, let's say My Birth or Henry Ford Hospital, in the 1930s, they would have been incredibly shocking. She had the courage to paint, as she's put it, I paint my own reality, and to paint it in the most direct way. She's totally unsqueamish. Her dress is standing, is hanging in, in front of uh, Wall Street, and she is not in it because she was appalled by um, the poverty and then the, the, the sort of luxury of capitalist New York and at the same time bread lines, protests. Basically it's Frida taking a rather dim view of Manhattan during the misery of, of the Depression. Diego's mural meanwhile unleashed a storm of controversy. 
In his scene of a worker's utopia, he included Lenin, much to the Rockefeller's consternation. And all of a sudden, Frida told me, Lucien, you better hurry up and take photos as much as you can because it looks very bad right now since the newspaper article that said that Rivera was painting communist activities on the, and Rockefeller was footing the bill. Frida recalled. We were guests at dinner two or three times and we discussed the revolutionary movement at great length. The Rockefellers knew quite well that the murals were to depict the revolutionary point of view, that they were going to be revolutionary paintings. Diego refused to remove Lenin from the mural, and to public outcry he was fired. At midnight on February 10, 1934, the mural was removed from the walls of the RCA building and the space replastered. According to a statement given by Rockefeller Center to the New York Times, the removal involved the destruction of the mural. Her house was like a, really an exhibition of color and folklore, you know, of art. Her student, Fanny Rebel. So we get used to uh, uh, appreciate something that was not very appreciated in the middle class in Mexico. So it became a style of all the Mexican artists and the Mexican intellectuals to have in their homes all these, uh, the pottery and the textiles and the sarapes and the embroideries. Now it is very uh, common because everybody uses it. Spurning the fashions of the times, Frida wore the traditional regional costumes of Mexico. Mariana Morillo Safa was a child when she first met Frida. When I first saw her, because she always wore these uh, long Mexican dresses, I thought she was something like a movie star, someone I had never seen before, because, uh, well, people in Mexico didn't used to dress like that. She used to wear all sorts of rings, one or two on each finger. They were not expensive. They were Mexican jewelry, silver and uh, semi-precious stones, and she looked royal. Her idea was to make herself into a work of art, and the Mexican costumes not only identified her with the Mexican people, but made her into a marvelous creature. Her appearance pleased Diego immensely. The classic Mexican dress has been created by people for people. The Mexican women who do not wear it do not belong to the people, but are mentally and emotionally dependent on a foreign class to which they wish to belong. But Frida's costumes were not enough to prevent Diego from having affairs with other women, including one with her sister, Cristina. In anguish over the affair, Frida painted a grisly scene and entitled it, A Few Small Nips, based on a newspaper story she read about a man who viciously stabbed a woman to death and when arrested protested, but I only gave her a few small nips. By the late 30s, Frida was troubled more and more by health problems. She painted What the Water Gave Me, a surrealistic work with disturbing images of death, sexuality, and pain. She had continuing problems with her right foot, crushed in the accident, and increasingly she suffered terrible pains in her spine. When I saw her, at least, she was always happy. She was making jokes. She was telling me stories all the time. I never saw her sad or in pain. I know that she was in pain. I knew it. She wouldn't, uh, you know, she wouldn't uh, complain. She was kind enough to give me, when she was with me, all her attention. When she was talking to me, she was talking to me, this little girl. You know, Frida didn't have any children. She never could. Uh, and she liked children a lot. She had several miscarriages and therapeutic abortions. There's a painting of her sitting on a bed with a doll, a baby doll, that is just a terrible substitute for an actual baby. It's said that Rivera did not want to have a child, and that may have been a kind of conflict between them. In 1937, 
Cardenas granted asylum to Leon Trotsky, who had been exiled from the Soviet Union by Stalin. It was Diego who petitioned Cardenas to allow the Russian revolutionary to come to Mexico. For a time, Frida and Diego, who knew Mercader, were suspects in Trotsky's death. Frida was questioned at length and released. What remained of their relationship was a self-portrait, which she painted for Trotsky and dedicated to him. The show was organized by André Breton, whom Frida met through Trotsky in Mexico. Calling her work a ribbon tied around a bomb, Breton claimed her as a surrealist. I never knew I was a surrealist till André Breton came to Mexico and told me I was. The only thing I know is that I paint because I need to. And I paint always whatever passes through my head without any other consideration. Up to this time, very little notice had been paid to Frida's work. She was painting at the same time that the muralist movement was going on. Everybody was painting enormous, mainly political paintings on public walls and doing little private things wasn't considered fashionable. It was considered rather peculiar. The actor Edward G. Robinson, while traveling in Mexico, was one of the few early buyers of Frida's work. Diego showed him my paintings, and Robinson bought four of them from me for $200 each. For me, it was such a surprise that I marveled and said, this way, I am going to be able to be free. I'll be able to travel and do what I want without asking Diego for money. There was trouble in their marriage. Diego's womanizing resulted in frequent separations. Frida, a sexually liberated woman, had her own affairs, some serious, some casual, with both men and women. She was a very sexual woman and tended to do what she wanted to do. But also I think that Diego didn't fill all of her needs. He couldn't possibly have. He was much too egocentric a man and therefore there's some needs that had to be, had to find an outlet with other men. As his symbol for American womanhood, Diego chose Paulette Goddard. He met the lovely young actress through her husband, Charlie Chaplin, when they visited Mexico. He was enchanted by her. The portrait of Paulette Goddard in the Pan American Unity mural has Paulette Goddard and Rivera holding hands around the tree of life. And Paulette Goddard is this incredibly attractive woman. And then nearby stands Frida, who's very much a sort of symbol for Pan-American unity, but not the attractive woman in Diego's life at that point. In retaliation, a despondent Frida cut off her long hair and painted a self-portrait with her hair cropped and in men's clothing. Her health worsened, and her doctor wrote Diego that the divorce had exacerbated her illness. They decided to remarry. Frida told a friend. I will go to San Francisco and marry Diego again. He wants me to do so because he says he loves me more than any other girl. I am very happy. They were remarried at San Francisco City Hall in December 1940, less than a year after their divorce. In a new self-portrait, Frida took her shorn hair and piled it haphazardly on top of her head as a symbol of her patched-up marriage. Frida and Diego managed to find an accommodation in their marriage, one in which she indulged his whims, caprices, and sometimes even his love affairs. I will not speak of Diego as my husband, because it would be ridiculous. Diego never has been and never will be anyone's husband. Nor will I speak of him as a lover, because to me he transcends the domain of sex. And if I speak of him as a son, I will have done nothing but describe or paint my own emotions. Diego echoed Frida's image of himself as a mischievous child and she his indulgent mother.
She called Diego Dieguito, which I could never understand when I was a little girl. Because imagine to call that huge Diego, to call him Dieguito, little Diego. I never saw a relation with such a uh, tender um, relation one to the other. Because she was protecting him and he was protecting her from everything. And that was uh, so sweet. Um, because uh, Diego has always had a, uh, he was famous for being, you know, a, a monster. He had such a tender and sweet relation to Frida, like if she would be uh, his little child, and she treated him like a child. She had surgery on her spine, which would be repeated several times during her life. It was wonderful visiting with her always, because in spite of her agony, she could be very amusing. She had wonderful stories to tell, and then she was beautiful to look at, really, the way she dressed. It's a sort of self-respect and uh, an unwillingness to let the image deteriorate. The image that she had of herself and the image that she presented to the world. I always felt that she painted so many self-portraits as a way of confirming her reality because she felt that her hold on reality, given her bad health, was rather tentative. And that if she painted self-portraits, she sort of recreated herself as a solid thing. It's somewhat like her paintings of herself with a crown of thorns or with her body split open. There was a, a kind of fascination with her own pain. It's also possible that she knew that Rivera couldn't leave her if she was in terrible health. So it could be that she would then go into a hospital and make herself more helpless, and then he would have to take care of her. She developed osteomyelitis, an inflammation of the bone marrow which caused progressive deterioration of her bones, a disease she might have contracted from one of her operations. In 1954, against her doctor's orders, a very sick Frida attended a demonstration to protest United States actions in neighboring Guatemala. Guatemalan President Jacobo Arbenz had instituted land reforms and expropriated holdings of the privately U.S.-owned United Fruit Company. Arbenz was ousted in a coup supported by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Frida asistió a muchas manifestaciones políticas. Lo sorprendente es que, en este caso, ella ya casi no podía tenerse en pie. Quiere decir que su compromiso con lo que ella pensaba que eran causas importantes para su país y para el mundo era total. Frida contracted pneumonia, and eight days later, at the age of 47, she died. He was, uh, you know, he was all the time, uh, um, how do you would say when you uh, put your nails in, in your hands, you know, like you suffer very much. And uh, the, um, the former president, uh, um, Cardenas was there too. It was very, very sad. Su aporte de una forma de expresarse en la plástica que es muy mexicana. Adelina Zendejas. Como mexicana, yo lo digo con mucho orgullo. Es la mujer más genial que ha nacido en este siglo en México. Diego was a giant in his time. Art dealer Marianne Martin. But you also have to look at him as someone who chose to paint, uh, to speak for a particular period. You know, he has his place in history. Frida doesn't really have a place in history. Frida has uh, occupied a smaller position, but a very universal one. I mean, there still are going to be people who have interior struggles and who uh, paint, you know, what they think. And there'll be, I'm sure that people aren't, the human race isn't going to change that much. And I think that her paintings will have more meaning 
uh, to individual collectors and uh, viewers than uh, Diego's. I think Diego's have to be explained in, in the time period, and hers don't. She's probably one of the two or three top valued Latin American artists that exist. Ann Horton, director of Latin American art at Sotheby's. My observation is that the people who collect her have a deeper relationship with her paintings than the people who collect Diego's. I think her time has come in a sense, but I don't think it will depart. Too late now, I realized that the most wonderful part of my life had been my love for Frida. If I had died without knowing her, I would have died without knowing what a real woman was. In the panorama of Mexican painting, the work of Frida Kahlo shines like a diamond in the midst of many inferior jewels, clear and hard, with precisely defined facets. We are all clods next to Frida. Frida is the best painter of her epoch. <laughs>